Jesus. What do you think? Yes. Here's the idea. Voting means you made a choice, that you made a choice for something. And I think there's no better way to know how to vote or know how to put that vote into place than to realize, Jesus, I chose him, and therefore, every choice of my life is based on what pleases him. Everything I do, and that's the way it was supposed to be. Because see, you didn't just accept Jesus to forgive your sins because you're such a goofball, which we, which we all were. We needed a Savior. Don't get me wrong. All of us needed a Savior, and that would have been great. But you accepted Jesus not just a forgiver of your sins. You accepted Jesus as Lord of your life. That means every decision, every step I take, the Bible says every, every, the steps of a righteous man are ordered. That means God measures every step that I take for my good and his glory. Isn't that good? So the idea is I choose to use every day and every moment. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with, um, well, first of all, next week I'll be out of town. And I don't normally tell everybody when I'm out of town because some people just don't show up. I don't know what that's about, but we'll just not even talk about that. But uh, here's the deal, because you're on TV anyway, so it's good. Uh, Bossom Zaire, remember, anybody know Bossom? Bossom is one of our members. He's in the ministry, and he travels around the world. He's a former Muslim, uh, petroleum engineer, got saved when he came to America, but he has an experience of growing up as a Muslim and being under a tyrannical order and bringing about the freedom of Jesus and how it freed him from a, 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 a very aggressive religious process and as well as a tyrannical political order. And his perspective on politics and Jesus is pretty incredible. And so he's got a great word for us next week, and I, it's about liberty in Jesus. And you have to understand, no matter what we're facing, there's a spiritual battle that we're facing at every juncture. It's not just a carnal one, it's a spiritual one. And we have the victory in Jesus, because I vote Jesus every moment of my life. So next week, we have Bossom. You're going to love it. He's got a great perspective with the gospel and how it works with everything about his life. I'm starting with um, the idea of judging in righteousness. This is called judging in righteousness. Now, here's the thing. Way back uh, around the Bill Clinton time, something happened. Um, the, it, it was almost like we were told, uh, we were told, judge not. There's a couple of scriptures that kept flying around during this time when there was some questionable activity that Bill Clinton was involved in. Now remember, we as believers pray for those in authority over us. Whether it's our guy or not, we pray with respect and honor because we want him to succeed in making America what it's supposed to be. Right? So it doesn't help that we're against the leader that we voted in. It, it, it'd be better that you pray. That's why the Bible says pray for those in authority. Now, whether it's my guy or your guy, it doesn't matter. We as believers pray for favor, life, wisdom for those in authority over us. This particular se season with Bill Clinton, back in the day, and I could, you know, every, every, every president's got some weirdness, you know, like, you know, Bush, George Bush had strategies, strategies that weren't great for him. He made up words. Um, and also the, the you know, Matt, uh, Weapons of mass destruction. So everyone's got an issue. But this situation happened. And I noticed something in the body of Christ. The body of Christ was, they were throwing out a couple of different concepts that almost froze us in our steps. And since then, kind of like we've been relegated to stay within your four walls. Don't get outside of this and leave politics alone. It seems to be this thing. <clears throat> and I, I want to address that. During that time, he looked comments like, don't judge or you'll be judged. You know what? You're right. We shouldn't judge. Or let him that without sin cast the first stone. You know what? You're right. Really shouldn't. We shouldn't be doing that. We as a church shouldn't. And we kind of, we, we left the marketplace of, of interesting conversation. And we, we found safety in a little four-wall room. We just stay within, our, stay within your four walls and you'll be fine, church. And these words came forth. Don't judge lest you be judged. Don't, he without sin, let him cast the first stone. Don't, you know, let him... So therefore, everyone sins, so we shouldn't cast the first stone. Or, hey, separation of church and state. You better make sure you stay in your line, your lane. Don't get outside your lane. And so I think I'm, I'm going to address those three things today and explain to you the responsibility of a church in community. Is that okay? If it's not, I'm going to do it anyway. So there you go. <laughs> now, the scripture that says, judge not, not lest you be judged, is in Matthew. And again, you have to understand, Satan came to Jesus with scripture. He came to him and said, hey, Jesus, if you be the son, then the Bible says in Psalm 91, verse 12, 
the, I mean, he didn't quote, he didn't say the verse, but it basically that's what he quoted. He said, if, if you, the angels will take charge over you, that you won't even stub your toe against the foot against the stone. So if that be true, and if you are the son of God, then, then I'm going to take you to the highest point in Jerusalem and jump off because the Bible says the angel will take charge over you. So you should just jump off and see if the angels take charge over you. And here's the thing, y'all, you have to understand the enemy knows the word of God. And he, if you're not a discerning individual, he'll use the word to confuse you. You have to be discerning. And so this, this issue came to Jesus. The very word to man, is being manipulated to see if Jesus will fall to temptation. That's what's going on. And Jesus says, you know, get behind me, Satan. You will not tempt the Lord your God. Right? So the word was used to manipulate. Jesus did not fall for the manipulation of the word of God. So when someone tells you, if someone, if one of our leaders back then, we should not judge, the church should not judge because the Bible says, look at Matthew, Matthew 7, verse 1, do not judge others and you'll not be judged. Well, that's what the Bible says. And you have to understand the style of the writings in scripture. If you study it long enough, you realize they'll make statements and the truth of this statement is found in the context that it falls in. And if you continue reading, it'll make sense. But if you pull one verse out of context, you're going to get a, you, 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 it's not going to work that way. Y'all with me? So look at, look at this. It says, do not judge others and you'll not be judged. So is he saying we should not judge? Well, the Bible says, don't judge others, you'll be judged. Keep reading. For you'll be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is a standard by which you'll be judged. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own? Hypocrite. Now, this is the context. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So in context, it's saying, if you're a liar, don't tell someone else not to lie. Stop lying. And then when you stop lying, then you can help a brother. Because you overcame something, and now you can have a perspective of overcoming. But normally, if a person is a liar, he'll find someone that's a worse liar than he is. And go, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. Yeah. So I can judge him. No. So, no. So how do we judge? Is it saying, do not judge? No. Judge properly. It's what the scripture is saying. Make sure that you are walking in righteousness. And as a righteous person, then you have the right to deal with specks in people's eyes. Without the light and the salt being in the world, how's the world going to know what's righteous and what's not? I went to, uh, uh, Charlie Yoder has a little uh, par uh, party or gathering she has for her ministry. And, and she had this little lady that, that was testifying. She had, the little lady had an ankle bracelet, you know, thing. Not a bracelet, it's an ankle monitor, right? Been in prison, she was 16 years old. She's like 35, 40. And you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe this woman's been in prison for all that time and she must be really, what is wrong? And then you hear her testimony. At age four or five, her parents are meth addicts. At age seven, she's mixing meth. There's no, so, there's no, there's no foundation at all of what's right and wrong. And then you expect this woman to make righteous choices? You have to see, the Bible says that Jesus looks at people. He saw the crowd and he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You should not be surprised at people's radical rebellion when you realize what was their foundation to begin with. And most people just don't have one. They don't have a moral compass anywhere. And how can we judge them without loving them, without reaching out to them, without at least hearing their story? We don't write anyone off, church. The Holy Spirit doesn't. The Holy Spirit doesn't write anyone off. But he asks us to stand in the, the process of bringing light to a, to a community. And that's what we do righteously. And we can judge righteously. Get the beam out of your eye of self-righteousness or, or ugliness or whatever, or criticism, and love. Then you can... Share with somebody else. What do you think, church? So let me just a few things. Don't judge or condemn someone for the sin you yourself commit. 
Well, I don't kill anybody. Well, I'd have it murdered. I don't do all the big, you know, big stuff. But there might be pride or anger or self-centeredness, which is the essence of every sin. So don't, don't judge or condemn someone for the sin you yourself commit. Get the sin out of your life. That's my next point. Through repentance and forgiveness, get back to righteousness and be prepared to help others overcome what you overcame. What do you think, church? That's how we live. I've overcome something, so now I have, I have information, and I'll come alongside and not judge you to put you down, but judge in a righteous way to build you up. If the Holy Spirit builds us up, maybe we should build each other up as well. What do you think, church? So the Bible didn't say, hey, do not judge, and then someone throws us out in an awkward situation back in the day, and the whole church went, you know, you're right. We probably shouldn't do that. No, we can discern better than that, church. We should discern much better than that and realize don't judge as a hypocrite. Judge as a righteous person because that's who you are. What do you think, church? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to realize that when you hear something throw, thrown out and about, don't get, don't get like paralyzed and go, well, I guess that's what it says. Ask the Holy Spirit. Discern well. Even the scripture. Go back. Another, another verse that was brought up is that you uh, don't, if he, he, he was without sin, let him cast the first stone. Well, you know what? All of us are sinners, so you're right. We shouldn't judge and we shouldn't cast a stone. And you got to put it in perspective what the story was about. If someone's going to throw that out there, it'd be better that you know what the story was about. What do you think, church? So let's look at that real quick. Real quick. Again, this is the next point. The first one that we talked about that kind of held the church in, in the paralysis was judge not. And we just went through that. Now, if this is a particular verse, or this particular concept, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone, implies everyone's sin. So the story is the religious order of the day, they, they don't like what Jesus is doing. And Jesus' message to a people is that there's a God that loves them, and he, he sent his son to die for, he's going to send his son to die for them. And so now we're in John 8. John 3.16 has already been, you know, been, been put out there. So it was because of love they are going to get saved. And it's going contrary to the religious order of the day, their message about you got to do, you got to do, you got to make sure, and God's going to catch you if you don't, you know. So, so there's a conflict of, of theology here. So the religious order of the day, they want to trip up Jesus. So they put together this, this farce. They put together a woman caught in the middle of adultery. Now, um, oh, this woman was caught in the middle of adultery, and they set this up. So the guy involved in the sin is somebody else's, I mean, is a, is a husband of somebody else to, for it to be adultery. And they, they coerced him or somehow got involved to get him to sleep with this woman, and they caught him right in the middle of it. And so uh, they bring him before Jesus and say, hey, look, the Bible, the law says that a woman who commits adultery should be stoned. And what do you say, Jesus? Now, they're expecting, this is what they set the process if he says we should forgive her, then the, the, the religious order of the day will say, you're going against the law of Moses. And the whole people go, oh, man, we, we can't go against the law of Moses. And if he says, well, we got to follow the law of Moses, oh, now you go against your message about God being love. So it's a very peculiar situation. And so when they bring this woman to him, expecting Jesus to be caught in this place of no-win situation that they've set up, he listens, and he goes down and begins to write in the sand. I love this about the Lord. This woman is caught in the middle of adultery. They have her there, probably wrapped up in some kind of blanket of some kind, but she's in a very exposed situation. He begins to write in the sand, and automatically the attention goes to what Jesus is doing. Don't you love that about our Lord? He changes the attention away from your sin to his grace. Isn't that awesome? And so all the attention goes away from the woman in sin to what is Jesus saying? That's why I say, vote Jesus. And so he begins to write in the sand. And I believe what he wrote in the sand was the law. This is what I believe, but nobody really knows. I believe it was the law dealing with adultery. And he's writing the law dealing with adultery. And everybody here knows the law. And in the law dealing with adultery, you don't just bring the woman who is caught in the adulterous affair. You bring the guy who is also caught. The guy's going, he's standing right there. Man, we got him now. Yeah, yeah, we do. We got him now. Oh, man. And what's he writing? He's writing the law about the adultery. What? Yeah, about the part that it says you bring the man to. And the man's there. The man that was involved with this thing. He's, and all of a sudden he realizes, if you're going to follow the law, I got to be uh, get stoned as well. I got to be there. And if he's going to show up, if they're going to bring him now to follow the law, 
bring him into the center to be stoned, do you think he's going to keep his mouth shut of who got this whole thing process started? So they're all going, uh-oh. And the woman is silent. And that speaks volumes as well. So as he writes in the sand, he stands up. And he says, okay, I got it, fellas. He states, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And all of them have sinned against this woman, against this man. They conspired together. It's a lie. And they're all going, we're ready to do this. But if I throw the first stone, then I got to bring the guy up. The guy's not going to go up voluntarily. He's going to blow this whole thing up. Ah, you know, I just forgot. I got to backwash my water pick. I need to take off right now. Thank you. And, and then the story goes, and this is why he that is without sin, let him cast a first stone, is specifically to this situation of deception. Jesus has turned up the heat because they've all sinned. And they can't bring a conviction against a broken woman. Now, this is really important. The woman is silent, and in her silence is repentance. She knows the law. This is what she's saying in her silence. I've run my course. I, I know that I'm guilty. I could bring the guy in, but I, I, I'm done running. I've lived a terrible life. I, I, I deserve it. And I throw myself at the, at the mercy. I, I could make a big thing right now. I said, if you're going to kill me, you got to. But you know what? I'm, I'm done. I'm ready for the consequences. I submit myself to the order of God. That's a broken and contrite heart, y'all. And the Bible says a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. So in her silence, she's screaming repentance, brokenness. Isn't that awesome? And so Jesus, then we find the story. If we can find the story in John 8, um, 9. I don't know if you have it up there. Maybe. Oh, good. When the accusers heard this, he who is without sin, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until the youngest, I think is what it says. And Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. So now it's just Jesus and the woman. Next verse, please. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? This is so beautiful. And Jesus, and didn't even one of them condemn you? Does anyone condemn you? Look, the accusers, do they condemn you? Next verse. No, Lord. And she calls him Lord. Do you realize this is chapter 8? For someone to call Jesus, to Jesus Lord is to say, I recognize you as the Messiah in chapter 8. I have faith. I've seen what you've done. I recognize who you are, Jesus, Lord. So he says, no, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. Neither do I. Did Jesus just wink at sin? Is that what we're supposed to do? Wink at sin? Just kind of, you know what? I'm, I'm the Messiah. I'm the baddest guy. So I can kind of override all the law and forget it. No, a higher law of brokenness and compassion kicked in. A broken and contrite heart kicked in. That's, that's Psalm 51 kicked in. And God saw a broken heart and he reached out with grace because faith was being expressed in his son and forgiveness was given because there was brokenness. What do you think, church? Isn't that wonderful about our Savior? So we don't wink at sin. Jesus did not wink at sin. He saw a higher order of repentance and brokenness, a higher law of grace. And he gave grace. So that's how this thing works. Let him who without sin cast the first stone. If there's brokenness, repentance, are you kidding me? There's, there's, there's forgiveness. There's righteousness. Are there consequences for dumb acts? Absolutely. But there's, righteous, there's a righteous way to repent. There's a righteous way to give forgiveness. There's a righteous way to, to operate. And she operated in the most righteous way by being quiet, submitting, calling him Lord, 
forgiveness, acceptance, restoration. Jesus saw a broken and contrite heart and he deflected and covered. He heard honor and faith as she called him Lord and he extended grace. He saw repentance and he forgave. Righteous judgment produces repentance, contrition, and honor to God. It's okay for you to be righteously speaking the truth. It's right for you to say, this is not well, this is not going well. And the person has an opportunity when he's, when he bring, when he's brought to the light to repent for contrition, for restoration. What do you think, church? That's wonderful. But if you're going to argue what is, is, then there's probably not a whole lot of contrition in that. And the judgment is still righteous. What do you think, church? We shouldn't back away, church. Do not back away from the word of God. Make sure you understand how it applies to every situation. And don't let the enemy back you in a corner by throwing out these little whimsical verses that will stall you out because you're caught like, I don't, I don't know what to think about that. You should be better than that. The church should be better than that to discern better. What do you think, church? This is our right, church. But the enemy will come to you and throw out a verse that seems it's the word of God, but it's out of context. And it's up to us to know how to discern and then teach and walk in righteousness, church. This is our job. It's what we do. We are the catalyst for change in a darkened world because we are representatives of light. And we have the right to judge righteously, church. Number three, <laughs> another term that was thrown out there, and I don't mean to be picking on Bill Clinton. He's such an easy guy to be picking on. But, it's, but during that time, these things started, it kind of, it's, it's kind of evolved to keep the church out of politics. Keep, be quiet. You shouldn't say anything. And, and we, without, we have to be involved, y'all. We have to be. Amen. We're part of community. We have to be. And so there's another terminology, another quick, really cool political concept that that we hear separation of church and state just real quick where, where do you where did where did that term come from just real quick you're not going to find it in the u.s constitution you're not going to find it in the bill of rights you're not going to find it in any amendments you'll not find it in any federal statute ironically you will find this term separation of church and state it did appear in a constitution of the former ussr Now let that this thing in for a minute. That term appeared in the in the Constitution of the former USSR, separation of church and state. And where did they get that from? I'm glad you asked. On January 1st, 1801, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut. Thomas Jefferson used this statement, separation of church and state, to make clear that the government was not to be, to not to interfere with any religious practice. Jefferson wanted a wall of separation from there being a state church. Remember why they left England. King George VIII wanted to divorce his wife under Catholic, it was a very Catholic state, a Catholic religion in England. So he created another religion, the Church of England, which gave him the right to divorce his wife. It was a fairly closely run church state, and people were leaving England to have the freedom to worship Jesus. And he was saying, don't worry, Baptists. I'm going to make sure the government doesn't interfere with you. Isn't that awesome? It was, it's, it's not found anywhere in our, so what, where did we get this idea? Hey, big hey, church, you got to be careful. Don't get out of your lane. Separate church and state. No, it was to a Baptist organization. What do you think about that? Y'all, we should be involved. And don't let anyone kid you on this. But realize there are people that will throw this stuff out to keep you out of being an influencer. And church, you were saved to be an influencer. 
So how do we influence? It's really important. Here's what we, 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 the church, can get off here, y'all. Jesus would look at the people, like I said earlier, and he, he had compassion on the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Y'all, we don't look with judgment against because they're involved in weirdness. No, we, we see a broken and contrite heart looking for something to live for. And no matter how ugly their sin may be, they're trying to find something to fill the deficit within their spirit. They're like sheep without a shepherd. That's so we look with compassion. So I wrote this down. The church is not against the world. We're not against the world. With compassion, we present the truth of God's unrelenting love for his children. That's what we do. And if we stay quiet, this doesn't get done. This is our place. In Proverbs 14, 34, it says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So we live righteously. Everything that we're the church is supposed to do is to present the righteous aspect of any situation. And we find the answer to every problem in his word. And we build our life on the unshakable, unmovable word of God. Because we chose Jesus. What do you think, church? That's just a better way to live. So I had a whole bunch of of how to live righteously and all these little things. And I thought, and then I saw this a couple of days ago and I had to redo, again, once again, had to redo my message. A very uh, prominent theologian that I really love, amazing writer, John Piper. Great guy, uh, got great material, good man, great theologian. He made this statement the other day that I just thought, here we go. He made, this is a quote from John Piper. Christians might do best by sitting out the presidential election. Since a vote for either Trump or Biden cannot be justified. Y'all, when the church can't understand their place in community, and when our religious leaders somehow, the air must be thinner in ivory towers, don't realize our place in this world. I, and again, I, I highly, last week some other guy spoke. This week I'm going, are we still dealing with this? Y'all, so I have to deal with, with this one aspect one more time. <laughs> and hopefully we'll, we'll get to it. Um, it is unbiblical for you to sit on the sidelines during a voting era a time. Let me explain to you why. Righteous we are righteous in judgment. We are righteous in our citizenship. Yes, we're part of a community. You were designed by God for this very moment. This, this is a time in which you live, and it's not by accident. It's for you to rise up and be a light right now here. So I'm going to have to go. I, you know, I think everyone has read this, but I, I just have to walk through this. We're going to look at Romans 13, the first seven verses, because it seems like we forgot this. This is for the body of Christ. By the way, this is for the body of Christ that Paul is instructing under Roman rule. Out of control, tyrannical Roman rule. Y'all with me? All right, look at verse one. Everyone must submit. And this word submit in the Greek translates to obey by reflex. In other words, I don't pray about, Lord, should I pay my taxes? It's like people shouldn't be should, people shouldn't wake up in the morning on Sunday and say, "Lord, should I go to church?" No, I just by reflex go to church. It's what we do because we want to be together. Lord, should I should I should I pay my taxes? No, you pay your taxes. So they're by reflex. You've learned to just by reflex. You get up in the morning, you get dressed, you you go to work. It's by reflex. That's what it means. So therefore, everyone must submit by reflex the two government authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Roman rule. That's faith, church. Whether it's your guy or not, you have to believe that God has placed them there. And you got to go, then, then what's our responsibility? To pray and submit to them. Stand for righteousness, but keep praying. Verse 2. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and will be punished. Now, this word punish is a different word. It's a hard word. It's a hard concept, but it's saying this, basically. 
There's a system. And the system of government was to punish uh, lawbreakers. The, the church doesn't punish lawbreakers. God doesn't punish lawbreakers. The, the, the system of government punishes lawbreakers. If you, if you do something wrong, the system of government is there to make sure you stay in the right. Does that make sense, everybody? And God institutes uh, authority. That's why all this out of control rioting, if you, to have a peaceful riot or a peaceful riot, a peaceful uh, gathering is one thing. To start breaking the law, you need the law to function as its full power to keep society in line. That this is, this is ordained by the Lord for it to operate this way. But remember, this is under Roman rule. So for a, a believer to hear this from Paul to go, Paul, are you kidding me? Do you realize they're throwing people in line? I mean, yes, submit. That means I'm not of this kingdom anyway, but I'll stand for righteousness. I stand for Jesus. I pay my tax. I do everything right. And we honor the Lord. What do you think, church? I'm just telling what the scripture says here. Verse three, for the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of authorities? Do what is right and they will honor you. Church, I've never been involved in a drug sting. I've never been hauled in at three o'clock in the morning on the wrong side of town with a woman that's not my wife doing drugs because I don't do that. I don't break the law. I don't. I'm just saying. Yeah, thank God. What I'm saying is live righteously and things go well with you. Verse four, the authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you. That's what government is supposed to be about, keeping things in order. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. And by the way, church, just to let you know, there are people that are confused that, yes, there are people who are searching for something to live for. Yes, there are people that are like sheep without a shepherd, but there also are people that are evil. There are people that are evil and do evil things or get people to do evil things. So I just want you to know that this is, this is important. Verse five, so you must submit, once again, by reflex, you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience, a clear conscience. Now, here's the thing. If our government was set up this way, unless you make a million dollars or or more you don't you don't you don't vote and we go well you know I'd love to vote but you know that makes sense they're they're the guys that make all the money so we they have the right to vote so in this particular government let's say we had a government that said you know this is the way we're going to run it we're all going to have all the rich people vote well you know what i get it so i don't have to worry about voting or if they said your vote under $20,000 a year, or let's say $100,000 a year, your vote is only worth one vote. But those that make a million dollars or more, their work vote is 10 vote. And you go, well, you know what? That makes sense. And my vote, so you know, my vote doesn't really matter. In the government that we have, every American's vote is worth one vote. And was bought and paid for you by Patriot's blood. And it's a stain by men and women who lay down their life for you every day. Soldiers. Your vote is worth as much as anyone in the country. And to not vote, to keep a clear conscience, to just do what you're supposed to do, this is what you've been given the right to do. And to not do it is almost like, then you don't understand being submitted to those in authority. It's a wonderful country and this wonderful gift of being an agent of change by my vote. Clear conscience. Verse six, pay your taxes. Two, <laughs> I like that, pay your taxes. 
for these same rate, same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. I may not like who's in my authority, but I respect and honor him. If I'm working at the quick trip and my guy that I'm under is a jerk, I, if I continue to honor, God will exalt me. If I continue to honor those in authority over me, whether they're good or bad, God will exalt me because I'm doing things as unto the Lord. I'm not doing to, you know, honoring a guy because he's got a great guy. He's a great personality. I'm submitted to him because he's a man of authority and I speak with respect and honor and God will take care of me. If you don't like the president, I get it, but he's in a, a, he's in a position and an office of honor. Respect the office. It'll go well with you. Pray for the man. Don't get cut off with personalities. What is his policy? If you don't like his policy, well, in four years, you get a chance to vote again. Or in two years, you get a chance to vote again. <sighs> Respect and honor, church. And we do. We pray. Respect and honor. Amen. Let's give a good hand clap to the Lord. First Timothy 2, 1 says, I urge you. This is First Timothy. I urge you, first of all. Look, look, look what, what Paul is saying. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Number one, two, ask God to help them intercede on their behalf, three, and four, and to give thanks for them. And then he says, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceable and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. What does that mean? That means for my kings in authority, I pray for all people. I ask God to help them intercede for, on their behalf and give thanks for them, whether it was George Bush or the other Bush or whether it was Clinton or whether it was Obama, we prayed as believers for health, for wisdom, for prosperity, for goodness, and we thank God that he placed them in that place, even though I couldn't figure out why in some cases, but he did. And therefore, we as a church were mobilized to lift up our leadership because that's how we walk in faith, church. And if... If whoever gets in office this next couple of weeks, we will pray as a church for them, for prosperity, for goodness. We'll thank God because God exalts those in, in positions of authority. And we'll be just fine because we're doing what honors the Lord. What do you think, church? A lot to cover, I know. Amen. So here's my tiffa. <laughs> I judge righteously with compassion. Therefore, I'm empowered to live righteously. And living righteously as I vote Jesus, I choose Jesus. Therefore, everything that I do honors him. I look at the platform. I look at the personality. And I vote what best looks righteous before the Lord. I encourage you. I encourage you. Don't vote emotionally. That The, the world would love for you to stay in the emotional realm. Look at the platforms. Make a decision and do not, like some people have said, hold your nose and vote for the best candidate. No, we do not hold our nose. We, everything we do is unto the Lord. We vote in faith. This is the, we, you don't just you know, throw the dice. You investigate. You ask the Holy Spirit to show you. He guides your steps for righteousness. You make a choice in faith, which to me is the most amazing gift that even believers and unbelievers have this great opportunity to vote in faith. Because there's every possibility of somebody being on that side, manipulating your vote, taking it away, dropping it, losing it. But we say, God, we in faith, we put this out there. Isn't that awesome? So we walk in faith, church. I know this sounds so unspiritual. <laughs> no, it's the most spiritual thing we could do as people of community. As people of, this is our community. And we're a part of it. We're not like separated from it. We're right in the middle of it. We're in Market Street, USA. And we, with our thoughts and conversation, we speak life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. It guides our step. We thank you, God, that you enlighten us. And our decisions are made not just because of our wittiness. Our decisions are made led by the spirit of the living God. And I thank you, God, that each one of us are looking for you to be Lord over this situation we choose jesus we choose to be led by him in every aspect of our life 
And so, God, we commit this to you in Jesus' name, this issue. This, these next couple of weeks, this amazing nation has an amazing gift of voting. And I pray believers will vote in righteousness and put action to their faith. And so we thank you. We commit this to you, God, for our country. We lift up those in authority over us. We pray, Lord God, for favor, for goodness, for your grace and mercy to cover them. We pray for wisdom and life. And for whoever's going to get into the office this next couple of weeks, God, we lift them up to you. And we thank you guide their steps. And that they surround themselves with, with amazing men and women of wisdom. And have a fear of the Lord. And we love you. Now, there may be someone here who never received Jesus. I've said a lot of things about him. There's a way to receive him, and I'm going to talk, we're going to pray that prayer of receiving Jesus as Lord. Not just the forgiveness of our sin, but actually Lord of our life, Lord of our every day. So if you repeat this prayer after me. Father, and I call you my Father, I thank you for Jesus. I receive him as Lord of my life. His blood forgives my past, and his resurrection power guides my future. I belong to you. You are my father. And I am your son. In Jesus' name. Amen. We prayed that prayer for the first time. It's important to tell someone. We're going to have our prayer team up here in a little bit. Please let them know that you received Jesus today. If you're online, the first time you prayed that prayer, please let us be a part of that. Tell Pastor Gary that you received Jesus today, that we can be part of your wonderful journey in Christ. Uh, we decided to take communion every time we get together because we just believe it's the right thing to do from now to the end of time that we take in this wonderful opportunity to remember who we are in Christ. If you get the bread ready or if you, if you not, don't have your, your communion elements, lift your hand and we'll get them right to you. There we go, around there. And uh, this we decided since this coronavirus kicked in that we would remi remind ourselves who we belong to. The Bible says that we should do this in remembrance of who Jesus is, not remembrance of your sin, but remembrance of who he is. Why did Jesus say this, to do this in remembrance of me? Because we forget. We get caught up and distracted with things of life and we forget who we belong to. We belong to a healer, a deliverer. We belong to someone that measures our steps for our good. We belong to the, the Lord God who knows our future. He's already been there. So uh, if we'll lift the bread to the Lord right now. Now, Father, I thank you this bread represents your body that receives whippings on your back. And God, through those stripes on your back, the Bible says that we are the healed of the Lord. So as we take this, we remind ourselves of our healing. And whatever right now, from the common cold to COVID, in the name of Jesus, it bows its knee to this wonderful gift of Jesus. Let's all take together. And lift the cup to the Lord. Now, God, we thank you that you do all things well. You not only provided healing for our bodies that you set for us to remind ourselves of the healer, but you also shed your blood that took care of every sin that we could stand righteously before the Father because of Jesus, our advocate. You took the bitter cup of our sin and failure and you poured in this wonderful cup of redemption into our hearts that we can stand before you righteous, face to face, God, worship with you. And we thank you that you call us sons and daughters. Let's all take together. I lift our hands before the Father. My God, we lift our hands and we surrender everything to you. As we confess who we are, God, we cast away to you right now any false identity the enemy has been trying to put upon us. And we receive once again this wonderful robe of righteousness, sons and daughters of the Most High. And we rejoice in you. That's our confession. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's a good God.